Before I forget, let me point out that the small TV-like button here turns the STF, the auto stretch parameters that you have finally set, it turns it on and off. So this is different than reset. The parameters remain fixed in the tool, but whether they're applied to the tracked view that you're looking at to your image is uh, controlled by turning this on and off. And there are reasons why you'd want to do that. Notice how the, the green bar here goes away when you turn it off, but is visible, of course, when it is in play. The next important feature, and probably the most, uh, the most interesting feature of the screen transfer function, is the auto stretch facility. You use this all the time. Let me just reset. And what it does is it calculates, based on an algorithm, a black point, a white point, and most interesting is the midpoint value. It calculates where to put this to kind of brighten up the screen, just as we were manipulating a moment ago. It is a nonlinear way to display or map these brightness levels in your image. And I apologize for using a word that I haven't yet defined, uh, but it is different than a one-to-one -one relationship of brightness levels. I'll demonstrate that very shortly. It automatically calculates them. So you press the button here, and this is the result that you get, a brightened version of your data. And often a very pleasing one, the way that this it works in general, it gives you a, a nice result. But it is a calculated result, so that anytime on this particular image, if I click that button, I'm always going to get exactly this result, unless I change the parameters about how it calculates this, which you can do. So let me show you a couple of seemingly hidden things. Uh, thing number, well, they're, you can act, they're not so hidden. If you put your cursor here, you'll read what they are. It says that if you control click, you can access those parameters that you can manipulate. I'll show you that in a moment. But there is a second fixed setting that you can take advantage of by shift clicking on this button. So you can control click on the button or shift click on the button. The shift click does just a boosted version of auto stretch. It's just basically a, a brighter version of this result. That's all it is. So I am holding down my shift button and then I'm going to click and now it gives me a brighter version. Then I can go back to the other version, then I can go back to the brighter version, and so on. But again, this brighter version will always be this way um, unless we change the parameters. So let's look at what those parameters look like. I'm gonna now press on the keyboard the control button and click on the auto stretch, and now I have the parameters kind of hidden in here. Now, first of all, I would say that the uh, the auto stretch parameters, just when you go control A on the keyboard or you press the little radioactive icon there, they're pretty good. I mean, they're a great starting point. And then you can manipulate the white point and the midpoint or do other things from there. But if you want, in general, a different kind of result every time you press the control A or you press that little radioactive button, you can affect how this presents this mapped, these map brightnesses by manipulating these parameters. So there are two parameters of concern. Ignore the bottom two, which deal with the boosted version of it. These two parameters, the shadows clipping and the target background, are the ones that control basically how bright that image is going to appear in this nonlinear way. So the shadows clipping, let me just indicate one thing that it's doing. It measures the median of the target image, and let me just uh, define what that is, or at least interpret what that is. The median of an astronomical image, with some exceptions, is the sky. That means if the image has basically stars and galaxies, but mostly sky pixels, the median is going to be the average value or the median value of the sky because all of those other high and low values um, are not going to be um, most likely used or they won't affect the median result. So it's mostly the sky unless you have a, a nebula picture like this and even then it probably wouldn't be a big effect. So this is defining what that lower range is for the sky and it isn't by manipulating this, you can change how dark basically things are going to be in the image. And you don't want the black. You want to be able to see everything, uh, but not have them black. 
So make an adjustment here and you press OK. I'm going to make it even uh, more negative, which is just all that means is it is a certain um, number of standard deviations below that median value, a slightly smaller number than the median value. That's all that means. We press OK and we get a, a darker version of this image. There is, a, however, I'm going to go back into it, a relationship between this and the target background as well because it also specifies the total range between the black point and that midpoint value. So this target range also affects the overall brightness. In fact, this is that midpoint slider. Um, it's going to calculate the mean of the background and that should be all of the light from the objects and everything all added up together and then it does some math to calculate you know what it's going to do it's going to do some math to figure out what is the best place to put that midpoint slider to give you a target background that equals whatever you specify so it's going to figure all that out for you all you're going to specify is i want a target background that is 0.25 or whatever you want so if this was too dark, we could make it a higher, um, a, a brighter target background. We go OK. And now the image is a little bit brighter. Now th the thing is that now if I go to another image and we hit our auto stretch, it's going to apply those settings, not the original ones that we had, but now these new settings that we were specifying um, for this image. So let's just verify that that's still true by hitting the control click. And yeah, you'll see our settings are still in play here. And now I'm applying it to uh, this image. If you like the default numbers, you can always just hit the reset button and it'll give you back you know, what we started with, those default uh, results. So you'll get back exactly where we started. So don't feel like it's a danger or something to manipulate those values, you can always get back uh, to what you originally were searching for or what you originally had. And the boosted factors here, those are basically uh, basically a uh, factors that affect, or it's, it's calculating from here. So in other words, it takes whatever this factor is based on this number for the clipping value to give us the boosted version of the image. Same thing is true here, the boost background factor. So I guess this multiplies it by two. So whatever this target background is, the boosted version is just this number multiplied times two. So it's just kind of a second variation or version of the auto stretch, but a brighter one. And that way, you, when you hit the shift button, shift click on that little radioactive button, you will get a, a brighter view. You can load and save these parameters if you like something and you want to keep it. Um, that's also something that you can do. So I've explained the how, but I haven't really said why. And the why actually deals with the data itself. I will just simply say that there are some images where you're going to want to potentially mess around with these two parameters to give you a particular kind of look. There are some objects that are just so bright. Let's look, uh, I'm going to close this for a moment. If you look at the region right around this star, they are so bright that unless you use a good nonlinear uh, kind of display, you won't be able to see all the detail right into the star without making the star look crazy or uh, making the nebula blow out in its brightness. So by manipulating that background and that midpoint setting, um, you are able to get to a target level, I guess in this case, you're able to get it to a place where you can kind of see both things. And that can be a starting point for much of the processing that will follow. I have found it useful, for example, to manipulate those parameters um, if I'm trying to display a globular cluster very well because I want to show the resolution of all the stars in the very center and also all the dim stars that are in the very outer parts, the halo of the globular cluster. So that, that's just an example where it might be a creative tool to use to give you a very particular kind of look. And then once you've established that look, you can permanently keep what you see on the screen. So it's like a what you see is what you get kind of activity 
that is one of the benefits of being able to man manipulate things with the STF tool here, is that once we see things on the screen in a way that we like, maybe we want to lock that in and keep it exactly as we see it. And we will do that by coordinating with the next tool that I'll describe, which is the histogram tool. Before we leave the STF tool, we need to examine one more really important feature, which deals with how it interacts with color pictures. So I'm going to create a color picture, but I'm going to use, instead of um, the Running Man Nebula, we're going to look at the Dumbbell Nebula. I've got some Dumbbell data here. Here's a red image, green image, and a blue image. Let's very quickly make, using a channel combination, a color picture. Now, in a later section, if this section is earlier than it, I will, of course, mention how this little utility works. But basically, you load each of the views that represent the color channels into their appropriate fields, and you press execute if we're making, in this case, an RGB image. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And here it is, an RGB image. Now, if I hit the auto stretch function, we can see that the STF is being applied. That, because um, there's a green bar there, you can see that the background has this really muddy green red kind of cast to it, and uh, that the the nebula, of course, is very bright. So, if we wanted to worry about that kind of setting then we can manipulate you know, the auto stretch or move these sliders around and so on. But that isn't what I want to show you. It really does deal with color data in the sense that if you want to visualize color data, this is not a way to correct the color data. This isn't the way to um, actually adjust it, but just for visualization purposes. If you have color data that you want to combine to see what it looks like, but because the the background sky levels are different between the color channels, you may get an effect that looks like this. And you might want to neutralize the sky or background so that you can kind of get a sense of what the image looks like. Well, there's a way to do that. To neutralize the background here, I'm going to remove this for a moment, it deals with whether we're applying the screen stretch functionality to all of the channels in exactly the same way which is kind of like it's basing, it's basing it on maybe the red channel and then it's applying it to the green and the blue. Or we do that STF uh, calculation of the black, uh, that is the clipping on the black, as well as the, the midpoint and the white point, but we do it on each channel individually. And it's going to come up with a different answer because the backgrounds are different in each of the images. And by applying that um, systematically to each of these three channels, it's going to equalize those background levels roughly because it does shoot for kind of like that target brightness. And if the target brightnesses of the backgrounds are equal, then your background will appear neutral. That's what this is going to do. It's going to neutralize the background if I unlink See, this is um, when we have the channels linked together, meaning the STF is being applied in the same way to each channel. If we unlink the channels, now when I do the STF, it'll calculate for this one, and then it'll do another calculation for green and another calculation for blue. So let's try now. And having done that, you can see that by calculating individually, if we look in detail at where these white, uh, not white point, where the um, mid point levels are and the black levels are, we will see that they are slightly different in each of these channels. And that's what resulted in now what appears to be a correctly color balanced image. This should be the color balance that you get when you do your processing at the end of the day, because you'll do the background uh, neutralization um, as one of the steps, as well as the there's a color balance type step that's part of this process too. So I just needed to show when you have channels linked, it's going to apply one function, STF function, to all of the channels. If you unlink them, then it'll do it on each of the individual channels. And the, what you get is going to be a target background that's roughly the same, but it'll do whatever math is necessary for each of the channels. 
And if it happens to be that your channels are RGB, now you could have different channels, you know, an HA and something else, but if they are RGB channels, then by having a similar background target, you get to neutralize the background. And uh, that's a nice way to visualize color data. Yeah, that's all I really wanted to show, and it's, a, it's common practice to do something like that, to give you a sense of what's going on uh, within your color image. Another interesting thing to do is to link them again. And let's say that I wanted just to, again, for visualization purposes, I want to see the object um, in a way where I can see what's going on inside as well so it doesn't look too terribly bright. I can uh, link the RGB channels back with respect to one another. And now if I zoom in here to this mid level, if I take one of the mid-levels and I drag it, you'll notice they are all dragged um, in their corresponding offset, right? So instead of dragging just the red channel, I'm dragging them all to the right, which is going to make the image less bright in those mid-tones. And that will allow me to visualize the object, you know, kind of like a typical representation of this, the, uh, the Dumbbell Nebula. So just understand the usefulness of linking and unlinking the channels of whatever you happen to be visualizing if you have more than one channel in your view. Um, and, and that can be a very powerful thing to manipulate as you look at the data to make a decision or ultimately try to save this data in a way that you can move forward permanently changing this, um, changing the image and then doing further processing.